Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts, including TheAthletic.com. He is useful human Arif Hassan. Arif, how was your Thanksgiving? Uh, it was pretty good. I actually, this is the first Thanksgiving where uh, where we didn't cook very much at all, so much more relaxed. Uh, I mean, inherently because of that, the food could have been better. <laughs> wow! In other yeah, news, but, beggars yeah. can in fact be choosers. <laughs> right? Uh, no, no, it was it was great. Um, met with the uh, the girlfriends. I mean, we've been going to the the girlfriends family's Thanksgiving for like three years now. It was actually it's actually really good food. I just like throwing that in there. You just like throwing just a little bit of shade? Just, just no, a it's hair? like generic shade. It's more arrogance than it is shade oh, at anyone. Oh, okay. Like, I mean, it's not your bad, it's that I'm great, which is a very common theme for this podcast. Yeah, I think. No one would ever come, would listen to the show and think either one of us were arrogant, so. Right, yeah. It's unusual, I know. I'm sorry. I stepped out <laughs> of our lane there <laughs> staying in lanes is very important all of a sudden so that's that's what we're trying to do and uh i was about to say we we're going to stick to sports in the middle of talking about turkey but here we are uh so welcome to this episode of norse code we got plenty of stuff to talk about including the game against the packers the vikings were successful a lot of talk about green bay after that one uh as there should be and we will be discussing a little bit of that as well and we'll also be talking about uh, hamstring injuries, because what's a good game against a subpar team without a uh, injury? Right. That we need to uh, we need to worry about. So, uh, lots of things to talk about, including the mailbag. But uh, before we do, just want to thank you guys so much for listening, supporting Norse Code over the years. Again, we really do appreciate it. Whether you are tweeting out links, whether you are uh, responding to us on Twitter, sending us emails, subscribing to uh, Patreon, or uh, there it is. Describing I, to what? I'm describing, uh, subscribing to Patreon? Is that how we're saying it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the week for you to for you to figure out because it's it's not the Patriots. No, man. we're we're playing the Patriots. That's right. That's right. And for those of you who think this is a bit, no, I really am trying to just muscle through this. My my way of shaming is not editing this uh, this discussion. So eventually, I will get it right. Can't wait for the clip show when I'm just, you know, combining all of these, like, clips of me struggling saying this stupid <laughs> phrase. Anyway, uh, so, again, thank you guys so much for uh, for subscribing, uh, for, uh, for helping out. Really do appreciate it. Uh, as a bit of an addendum to our discussion uh, two weeks ago, uh, where we were talking about whether or not we were going to move to uh, an ad system with, uh, with the Norsemen, or if we were going to kind of do our uh, DIY thing um, outside of it, uh, we did want to provide an update. Uh, we have talked to the powers that be, and we have decided to remain ad-free. Uh, we will be doing this, uh, continuing this, I suppose, going forward. This does mean that we are turning down a potential revenue thing, so if you do feel any sort of pity for this particular decision and would like to uh, support us, you can do so in one of two different ways. You can go to uh, patreon.com slash Norse code, or you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code and, uh, and help there. Um, we will be off of the Norsemen relatively soon. If not uh, with this episode, then probably uh, one that's coming up soon. They will be unload. They will be uh, giving their, I guess, network uh, a boost and posting all of that. We do encourage you to, to potentially check that out. Uh, but we will not be associated with it. We will be doing our own thing, and our delivery system will need to be updated accordingly, likely through NorseCodePodcast.com and a couple of uh, other venues, including the Facebook page, which also will be um, providing, well, the links to the show. So we did want to just quick mention that, and if you do feel like you should uh, support the show after this particular incident or after this whole, you know, deciding the viewers versus anything else, you can go to Patreon.com slash NorseCode, throw us a couple bucks, just... We're helping. Uh, we're helping keep the Loch Ness monster at bay. Helping keep the uh, help keep the lights on. So that is uh, that is all we have for house cleaning, I suppose. A little housekeeping stuff. Yeah, um, no. I just wanted to add that I really appreciated getting all the feedback from everybody. It really uh, helped clarify the decision because James and I were going back and forth on this. Having us send out, uh, you know, a call for your feedback and getting your feedback um, was was really eye opening and pretty spectacular. So so thanks so much for that. 
Yeah, and, and just hearing back from our fans about anything is always really cool. And meeting people who listen to the show is, was awesome, as, as Arif and I uh, ran into in New York and Arif ran into in London as well. So uh, one of the reasons why we like the show is the interaction with the fans and, and just hearing your opinion and your opinion counted here. So, again, thank you guys so much. We really do appreciate it. Um, if you like the show, you can support us. I've already said how. So just uh, check that out or send a link to a friend. Post it on Facebook. Post it on social media. Just help us, uh, help us, get, the, uh, help us get the listens out. So, again, really do appreciate hearing from you guys. Thanks so much. That is it for anything non-Norse uh, code oriented, I suppose. Uh, so... You went and uh, and had Thanksgiving with uh, with the girlfriend's parents, I imagine. I uh, I did it with my parents and a whole mess of kids, and I got to tell you, I got too many kids. There was uh, I feel like the the food situation kind of suffered as a result of the uh, the number of people that were that were involved. Yeah, I still, I, I, I can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> as somebody who doesn't like kids, yeah, <laughs> I could I, I imagine. <laughs> You, you would have some form of sympathy. Like, yeah, even one, really. Just like. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's not even so much that I don't like kids, which, let me clarify, I don't. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, they're distracting. You got to take care of them. Kids have a remarkable capability of finding ways to kill themselves or whatever it is they do. Uh, hurt, and then it makes it more difficult mainly. to focus on making the food. So. Yeah. I made the realization this weekend that I didn't have green bean casserole. And I really like green bean casserole. But I made the realization I didn't have it. And I was really upset for a moment. It's like, how the hell did I go this entire – like, because I must have been distracted by a kid thing or something. That I didn't have any uh, – I didn't have any green bean casserole. I was like, Yeah, you can miss out on entire dishes because of children. It's one of my They're favorite very... things. Like, and the homemade, like, onions on the top. Like, how right? – I was very disappointed in myself. Not as uh, not as disappointed as some people were when they saw the picture of the uh, the cheese and the pie, though, because I couldn't find the grater and time was of the essence and I didn't want to be caught. And it was in the middle of the day. So I had yeah, to put I, that I, cheese I, in the I, pie. Actually, I sent that picture to a, to a friend who's not on Twitter, which I can't believe I have friends who aren't on Twitter. Um, and uh, and I was like, oh, hey, so, you know, my podcast host, James, because he I mean, he had already texted me back about about your cheese on pie take. I was like, hey, you want to see this? And he's like, holy crap. I thought he meant like a little bit of cheese. That's a brick. Man, what are you doing? I, I sliced it as thinly as I could, but time was of the essence and I couldn't find the grater. I needed to. As thinly as you could. I needed to. This was, this was all about knife, speed. Man? This was up. I, I used a knife. It's not like I just went to a hunk of, uh, of cheddar and was like, break. And just put like you might as well just put a on. wheel of cheddar on top of that slice of pie, man. That was a lot of cheese. It was so good. It was too much cheese, but it was so good. And people can be disgusted with me all they want. I don't care. Uh, between that and the pastrami I made this weekend, I was quite pleased with myself. Yeah, I mean, my public take is that you're disgusting. Um, and also, that's generally my take. But I do <laughs> want to try it once. So, reminder, folks. Water and cereal. This is who my podcast host uh, I was. Co-hosted. You anytime anybody brings up the water and cereal thing, I have to always remind them. You that cannot, it's indefensible. It was within two weeks of having the kid. Like until mm, you go through that, anything, anything that things. happens okay. two to Setting three weeks, example. anything that happens two to three weeks after having the kid, you're basically legally absolved of. Like you mentioned that uh, you get a you get like a speeding ticket. Sorry, I just had a kid two weeks ago. Oh, dude, sorry. Like go. Do whatever you got to do. Like, we're not going to we're not going to sit here and talk to you about anything involving a speed limit. Just try not to hit any other cars like it's you're pretty much absolved of any sins that happened during that period of time. And I w- thought I was in, in my mind. I thought I was adding milk or I thought I was cleaning out the bowl and there happened to be cereal in there. And I was very confused at the end of that. <laughs> very confused at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it happens. Uh, so Sunday night there was a game, and it was a surprising—I I don't want to say a surprising win, but just the way that it happened kind of took me by surprise, just because of how the game started. This was the beginning of the game. Looked like uh, the Minnesota defense was going to be carved up by Aaron Rodgers, and it looked like the Green Bay um, defense was going to be carved up by Kirk Cousins in our run game, and. All of a sudden, the Packers weren't able to move the ball anymore. It looked like. Yeah, no, it's kind of weird. I mean, we've we've seen the Vikings be 
fairly poor against opening drives. I mean, I think this happened against the Jets. This definitely happened against the 49ers. Um, I mean, the Vikings did better against the Saints uh, in the second half than the first half. Uh, and I, I looked this up. Uh, I was talking to, I mean, someone had just tweeted me during the game. And I was like, oh, this is actually an interesting question because I know I found evidence for this a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, let's see if it's hold, held up. So the Vikings are fifth in points allowed. They have the fifth best defense in points allowed in the second half of games. They've allowed the fifth fewest points in the second half. Uh, they've allowed the 21st fewest points in the first half. There's a huge disparity there. Now, obviously, this has ended up pretty good for the Vikings. I mean, they're fourth, I think, in points per drive allowed in total. Um, but that first drive is so significant in terms of the percentage of points that that it takes from the Vikings. And, you know, it might just be like the Vikings are like, you know, boxers feeling it out, trying to figure out everyone's reach and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, there's a real points on the board that will end up uh, mattering uh, at the end. So uh, it, it seems to happen a lot. Now, obviously, it didn't happen on the opening opening drive in this case. Uh, the Vikings three and out, Packers three and out, Vikings three and out, Packers score. Um, but uh, it's, it's a pretty similar principle, and I imagine the Packers are still kind of on their, you know, whatever the opening script is for, for a lot of opening drives. So that's something that I think is kind of worth exploring. Um, but... Yeah, I, it's it, it it did kind of change. I think our perception of the game because the Vikings were like ten points ahead going into the half. I think it was ten points going into the half, and I think a lot of people felt like it was like a three point game or something like that. it was a very close game uh, when it was a two score game. And, and part of that is just you know when you're playing against Aaron Rodgers, uh, any lead can can kind of feel ephemeral. But also it just it felt like you know because the Vikings had gotten punched in the mouth kind of early at least uh, defensively. Um, that, uh, you know, the lead wasn't quite as solid, especially because you could kind of just see the Packers kind of just going off at any moment. So, yeah, it is kind of interesting that the game kind of evolved into what essentially turned into a fairly consistent Vikings victory because they held the lead for most of the game. They held a double-digit lead for for a huge chunk of the game. Uh, I think the majority, and certainly the plurality of the game, if not the majority, um, but it, it kind of felt closer, I think, because of the way the game opened up. And it was uh, it was interesting to watch as the game progressed. And I, I the thing I want to start with uh, when we're talking about the game is the very end of it. I watching the dagger go in and watching Diggs make that catch that was admittedly behind him. Uh, watching that go in and be caught, we've seen Aaron Rodgers with any team uh, against any team with you know being seven points down just going oh okay well he's going to tie that up and well, just it, being able to just get that in was incredible it, it was incredibly aggressive but the fact that it was right. successful is why we're happy if that thing hadn't been successful we would be all questioning a bunch of people right yeah we'd be we'd be i mean as we'd watch the game we'd be like oh so this is how it ends right um I mean, because i mean vikings fans are conditioned that way um, even though I guess they, they should have at least one recent counterexample in the miracle, I think very often I mean, Vikings fans just feel like they're and probably fairly, I think, uh, feel like they've been at the worse end of comebacks than than at the better end. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that digs catch was was really uh, not going to say like a turning point. It was pretty critical. Um, it's interesting. Aaron Rodgers has this uh, reputation for being this incredible closer, really fantastic in terms of generating game-winning drives and fourth-quarter comebacks. This is a really new reputation that he's developed. I think uh, between 2008, when I think he first started uh, for the Packers on a consistent basis, to I want to say about 2012, 2013. Um, so that includes 2010 and 2011, which were probably his two best years as a quarterback. Uh, he was actually really awful in fourth quarter situations uh, with a score or two down. In fact, he had one of the worst records among any quarterback, not just elite quarterbacks, at generating those fourth quarter comebacks and game-winning drives. And there was even a, a really good take out there that was um, not that Aaron Rodgers should throw more interceptions, but uh, that he should play in a way in the fourth quarter when you're down, play in a way that will sometimes result in more interceptions because that kind of aggression will end up resulting in more touchdowns as well. And that balance especially with the talent level of someone like Rodgers, that balance will end up resulting in more fourth quarter comebacks. Now that's happened, right? Since I think uh, 2014 or 2013 or so. You throw enough uh, Hail Marys and be successful at it, you're going to get the reputation. Right. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. And and his Hail Marys have been remarkable. Like it's not even just, uh, oh, they're 50-50 balls, they're chance. I mean, he's like throwing 60, 70 yards on the run. I mean, the one against the Lions, I think everyone remembers that, uh, the one that shouldn't have happened because of a phantom face mask call. Um, but I mean, there's one against the Vikings. I think there was one against the Titans and he just kind of accumulated a bunch of them. We saw one, uh, essentially the opening week of the, of the NFL against the bears, uh, even though he shouldn't have even been playing in that game because he was injured. Um, and so I think he's fairly earned that reputation. Uh, and so the Vi- Vikings fans, I think would have been right to be just terrified, um, that, that Rogers, uh, was going to do this, which actually, this is a kind of an interesting question. Uh, that are an interesting circumstance that maybe we could even, I know we're on a tangent, but maybe we could even use to talk about Kirk Cousins, right? Because this is who Kirk Cousins is kind of right now. I mean, he, I mean, his Kirk Cousins has never had a year like 2010 or 2011 for Rogers. Uh, being he's a fairly high level quarterback. He's a top 10 quarterback in most situations. Uh, and, and outside of kind of what we would call clutch situations, um, which I do think that there's evidence for that in football. I've kind of come around to that. Um, but, uh, I think that outside of that quarters one through three, you know, he's, he's a top 10 quarterback. And then you get into these two minute situations, um, you know, final two minutes, of the second half, final two minutes, of the fourth quarter. And aside from the green Bay game, most of his career with Washington and Minnesota has just been kind of fumbling around in those two minutes, even, uh, like they, they can close it out, especially this last game against the Packers. They did a really good job closing it out and, and draining the clock, but they can't hurry up. Uh, and, uh, it's a, it, I think it's a different situation where I think, um, I think there's some similarities. Like I think Rogers is doing kind of some of the same stuff, reading the defense and, and acting and reacting as if it was the same thing. But, uh, you know, Rogers has, uh, I think a little bit more in terms of improvisational capability that he's kind of always shown that he just kind of tapped into where his, where his cousins may not. Um, but still, if you can develop that, if Rogers is the kind of quarterback that developed that maybe cousins can develop that too. So that's kind of something interesting to think about. It's kind of, a, it's, it's just watching it happen was just so surprising because we're, we're just programmed to think, okay, well, this is just gonna be a run and we're going to punt it. Like it, and that's exactly what they were expecting too, from the way they right, lined yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the Vikings have done it in the past, right? Third and long with a with a two score lead, uh, you know, late in the game. Let's run it so we can guarantee that we take forty five fifty seconds off the clock, uh, and then punt it. Versus, well, if we throw, you know, forty percent chance or whatever, it's third and long, forty percent chance or whatever, we're gonna get the first down. And and that's going to allow us to close out the game and win versus we're only going to take six seconds off the clock. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I appreciated that kind of aggressiveness. That's the kind of thing that uh, you want to see from from cousins. You want to be able to say, hey, we're going to put the ball in your hands on third and long. Interestingly, this is something that they wouldn't do with um, with with Teddy, with Bradford, with Keenum. Uh, and I say it's interesting mostly because Teddy has. Weirdly, and I think this is atypical, um, but he's one of the best third and long statistics uh, over the course of his like three year career than almost any quarterback. Like he's like third in the NFL or second in the NFL, better than like, you know, Rodgers and, and so on. Um, but in that specific third and long situation where it, he converts like some absurd amount of percentage, it's not like 57 percent or something like that. They were just like, ah, we're going to run the ball for two yards with uh, with Matt Asiata instead <laughs> so I, I find it interesting that that Zimmer um, either sees something in cousins or has changed his philosophy in that approach one of the two um, that has allowed him to, to consider throwing in a third and long to ice out the game as opposed to you know quote unquote trusting his defense which is better than the defense like in 2014 and 2015 and it's worth noting that this was a, either the second or third thing that happened this game that really just raise an eyebrow like, oh, we can do that? Like, we're allowed to? That touchdown pass to, I believe, Diggs that was on play action. I had, uh, in the middle of the bar, I had, I, I, it was more profane than this, was, what the F? Is that play action? Yeah, right. Holy F, it's going to work. <laughs> like, no one was, I, as it turns out, we're actually allowed to fake a run. And, uh, and the Packers truly bid on that. Yeah, uh, 
So someone asked, you know, hey, does it, does it feel like the Vikings are using play action a lot less than other teams? Uh, and so to answer that question, I looked up play action percentage overall for the Vikings and also play action percentage in this game. So in this game, it was less than the Vikings typically use it. So they use play action like 16 percent of their dropbacks. I think that's criminal because I think the Vikings had the ability to threaten the run basically any moment in the game, not because they were running well. I mean, they ran pretty poorly in the first half and then pretty all right after that. Uh, but because they were in situations where you would expect the Vikings to run. Uh, and, and that's all that, that matters for play action. Uh, historically, the evidence suggests that the ability to run the ball uh, well is not correlated to play action, but the ability to threaten to run the ball, which is basically just to say to be in a situation where the run is a credible threat um, as, a, as a strategic option um, – is important. So play action, probably not great on, on third and seven, um, but pretty good on, on second and one. In fact, it's, it's remarkable on second and one. Um, play action, not great when you're down 27 points, so probably don't do it. Um, pretty great when you're up 10, right? So I think that the Vikings, who were up 10 for a good chunk of the game, uh, should have run play action more uh, because they were willing to pass the ball. It's not like they were only running the ball once they got up 10. And aside from third and long situations, should have used play action, I think, help create better passing lanes. So in this game, they used it on 16% of dropbacks, which for context is is remarkably low. Over the course of a season, 16% would be, I think, the worst in the NFL. And if not, it'd be, or not, I shouldn't say worst, right, because it's not a qualitative statement, but the least in the NFL. Um, but uh, if you if, if you take a look at what they've done all season, it's not that much better. It was 18.6% for the course of the whole season. So 60% would be among the lowest in the NFL, which uh, I guess Ben Roethlisberger and Matthew Stafford are lower uh, in terms of play action percentage dropbacks. But um, if 16% is the, is among the lowest in the NFL, then 18% is certainly not that much better. It's uh, 30th of 36 qualifying quarterbacks in play action percentage. Uh, and uh, the, the reader also asked, hey, aren't Aren't Jared Goff and and so on, uh, Patrick Mahomes, aren't they uh, running play action on 30% of passes? Patrick Mahomes is at 29.9%. Jared Goff was last year at 30%. Uh, The Rams have gone all in on play action. They're doing it way more than I think any other team has since we've had the ability to track the stat. They're at Uh, 37.4%, which is, I mean, it's insane. I haven't seen a team go above like 32 over the course of a whole season uh, in PFF's history, and I bet ever. So, uh, yeah, uh, and Cousins has shown a remarkable ability to perform well uh, in play action. It's not just uh, that Jalen Ramsey quote at the beginning of the year. Because um, remember, Jalen Ramsey was talking about how I mean, he'd just been on like 18 different quarterbacks, and like Cousins, like, yeah, he could do play action really well. And everyone just kind of glommed on that because it was the offseason, right? It was, it was training camp. So everyone asked Cousins how to do play action. He gave actually a really good answer. Um, but, uh, we actually have good evidence that, that cousins is a premier play action quarterback. Uh, I retweeted, and I'm going to include it in the show notes now that I'm bringing this up. I retweeted, uh, a tweet from, uh, it's a, it's a Buccaneers fan that does a bunch of data analysis. Um, his Twitter handle is like moo something. I mean, that's how it goes these days, right? Like some of the best analysis is from like Moo three eight six or something like that. Anyway, it's a really good account, and I encourage people to follow it, and I'll include it in the show notes. Um, but um, over the past four years, only three quarterbacks have shown a consistent ability to significantly beat the uh, yards per attempt average gain in play action. So on average, quarterbacks generate about a yard and a half, I think, uh, on play action versus non-play action passes. And I don't think that that's uh, definitive by itself to say play action should be used more often because uh, maybe the situations that you're using play action and are also situations where you're just going to generate more yards per attempt, like second and one, for example. Um, but uh, only three quarterbacks have consistently been over a yard better than that 1.5 yards per attempt over the past four years, every single year. Uh, and they are Peyton Manning. Okay, that makes sense. Sam Bradford. Weird, but okay. And Kirk Cousins. Uh, Drew Brees is like really close to that, I think. Um, And maybe I mixed up Drew Brees and Peyton Manning there. But the point kind of remains the same. uh, That he's just consistently been better on play action. 
Uh, and so, yeah, the Vikings should definitely use it more. I, I feel like I talk about play action a ton. I wrote like three articles about it. So uh, I don't want to hammer the point home too much, but like do it. It works. He's good at it. Why don't we play to his strengths? Yeah, it's weird how when you design an offense, you try to do the stuff that you do well more. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to crap on Deflipa too much. I feel like fans <laughs> are doing that more than feel, necessary. I feel like enough people have done that already. Right. Well, uh, let's talk a bit about. Uh, well, we're already talking about Cousins. Let's stay on Cousins for a bit. Uh, Cousins was pretty successful. This is the sort of game that he was brought on for. Although people have said that for about the last five games for him. So I mean. Yes, he was brought on right. to start these football games. Yeah, he was brought on to play quarterback. Yes. <laughs> he, you know, he was brought on for this. He was paid a lot of money to be uh, to be winning these games. Yeah, the, basically all quarterbacks are paid for <laughs> yeah, that, but, you know, yep. whatever. Yep. Uh, he looked this good. This is why you drafted him. This is why you <laughs> paid him. This is why he's on your roster. <laughs> this yeah. is, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, did fairly well um, and really was hitting, uh, was hitting Rudolph uh, early and often. Yeah, Rudolph got more involved in the passing game than uh, he has. I think this might be his most involved since like week two or something like that, which that's appropriate. That's also a Packers game. Um, But yeah, uh, especially very early. Uh, I think by the middle of the second quarter, he had something like four targets, four receptions for some good chunky yardage. Uh, And I remember this discussion Uh, In the offseason, hey, Cousins is going to use the tight end a lot. He used tight ends a ton in Washington. uh, And DiFilippo has been parts of offenses in Cleveland and in Philadelphia that have used the tight end a lot relative to other teams, right? Because Gary Barnage, pro bowler. Gary Barnage, like I think he was like 35 at the time, pro bowler in Cleveland, uh, had 1,000 yards. Uh, Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard, very, very tight end focused offense in Philadelphia. Cousins. Last three years has been has been targeting uh, tight ends more than almost anybody else in the league. Um, the difference, of course, is that the Gary Barnage was the best receiver on that Cleveland team because Josh Gordon was suspended and like what do you Brian Hartline, uh, Devon Bess, uh, like those are your other options. And uh, Zach Ertz is a singularly talented tight end. He he might be a top five tight end in the NFL. Vernon Davis. Uh, and uh, and Jordan Reed are just this incredible tight end tandem to have. Rudolph is not a top five tight end, um, and and Rudolph plus Conklin uh, or Rudolph plus Morgan as receiving tight ends anyway are not a top five duo to have in the league. Uh, and so they happen to be parts of offenses that targeted the tight end a lot because when you compare the tight ends to the rest of the receiving core, Ertz versus say Jordan Matthews. Or Jordan Reed versus Pierre Garçon, which that one's a lot closer, obviously. Um, you know, the tight end is a really valuable piece. Here, I mean, it's Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen, right? There's a reason that, like, they're the top receiving duo in the NFL in terms of receptions and targets. Because they're good, right? And they're better than the rest of the... So, I'm not surprised that Rudolph wasn't targeted as often as I think a lot of fantasy al- analysts expected. Um but it is good to see him being kind of utilized in a game where, you know, he clearly has an advantage, right? Because, uh, I mean, Blake Martinez is like a pretty decent linebacker, but for the most part, in terms of uh, in terms of coverage linebackers, I don't think the Packers have anybody. They had to rely on like people like Josh Jones to play, you know, kind of this this big nickel and and so on, and 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 Rudolph can just feast on that, and and they did, and the Vikings did a really good job isolating Rudolph for those matchups. So, uh, it was good to see because uh, Rudolph demonstrated, I think. Because sometimes you get you get a Rudolph who who wins these really tough catches and drops the easy catches, uh, and in this one we just saw Rudolph win catches and a couple of them were pretty tough. Um, so it was really good to see. Um, he had an iffy game, kind of run blocking, but I mean, that's not why you paid him, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was it was good to see him get involved often because I mean the Vikings, if they're going to be um, I guess we want to call it a, a two-dimensional team, right? Because if they can't run the ball that well, and we can talk about Dalvin Cook in a second because he had a good game. Um, but if they really have two reliable targets, Stephon Diggs, Adam Thielen, and one of them is always banged up, right? Because it's either Diggs and, and now Thielen's been suffering from some injuries. Then you really need to expand how dynamic that offense can be in some way. And, and sometimes you can only fix that in the offseason by adding talent. Um, but, I mean, Rudolph is capable, right? For sure. Uh, and so kind of 
having the Vikings offense expand its capabilities to include the receiving options of, of Kyle Rudolph and Delvin Cook, uh, to some extent, Aldrick Robinson, who uh, did not, I guess, have a great showing or Treadwell, who had a worse showing. Um, that's great because I think that you could get into a situation where I think they even mentioned uh, that they were just kind of willing to. Uh, it was either the Saints or the Packers. Someone said, ah, let's just double both of them and forget about everyone else. And it's like, OK, I get it. That's pretty viable, I think, as an idea. Uh, you have to have, quote unquote, everyone else produce. And in this case, it was Dalvin Cook, Kyle Rudolph. So um, I forget if it was this game or if it was the last one that made the comment that Adam Thielen is not athletic. I think it was this it was, one. It was this, it was this game. Chris it Collinsworth. Was, yeah, Chris a Collinsworth. Hall of Fame receiver, right? Uh, Chris Collinsworth uh, fell into a trope, despite being a white wide receiver, of categorizing Adam Thielen essentially as the white wide receiver trope. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say Adam Thielen is not gritty and not hardworking and not lunch paley or whatever. Scrappy is scrap on the scrap. Yeah, um, I don't think he's literally a coach's son, but I'm sure a coach would love to have him as a son. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you could take a look at Adam Thielen's mock draftable chart. It's it's above average. Uh, ran a four four five at the regional combine officially. I know that he ran a four four two in one of his runs uh, at the regional combine. He's got a great three cone score. It's like a sub seven three cone, like a six eight something like that. Um, pretty good vert. Um, so you know, he's athletic. I remember this. Uh, I bring this up a lot. Because, but I, I like victory laps, so I'll do it. I remember the debate that uh, people had way back when, um, not Rodney Adams, Rodney Smith, the Florida State receiver, 6'5", only ever got like 200 yards at Florida State, um, was on the team. And he and Adam Thielen were battling it out for the sixth spot. And, uh, and you know, I was at camp every day, and I'm like, they should keep Adam Thielen. He's a better receiver. And, and people were telling me, no, they should keep Rodney Smith. He's 6'5". You know, he's, he's more talented. I said, what do you mean more talented? I'm like watching these guys, and one of them is demonstrating talent by like getting open and catching the ball, which back then Adam Thielen was not that great at catching the ball. He was double-clutching passes a lot and and dropping a couple of passes and so on. But he's but better than Rodney Smith. Uh, and, um, and I was like, he's getting open. He's catching the ball. He's a three-level threat. He can get open deep, intermediate, short, uh, and he can he can run after the catch. Um, they sh- I mean, Adam Thielen is more talented. What do you mean by talented? And really, they meant Rodney Smith was more athletic and he was bigger. And I was like, well, OK, Rodney Smith is bigger. He's six five. That's true. But we've seen a lot of big receivers fail in the NFL. Um, and uh, and and Thielen is not like five ten. He's like six one. So and he's not like a short receiver. Like a lot of people thought of Cordero Patterson as a tall receiver. And he and Adam Thielen are like the same height. Um, and so uh, I remember like. He's not more talented. You just think, and, and people are like, "Well, oh, he's got a higher ceiling." Well, no, he doesn't. Adam Thielen runs faster. He jumps higher. He's quicker. Like he's more athletic in all the ways that you define athleticism. And people would not get past that. Then, of course, Rodney Smith caught this like "quote unquote" game-winning touchdown against, I think, it was the Cardinals in the preseason, uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, from Teddy, who like just threw it high enough just for Rodney Smith to get it. And everyone's like, "Ah, oh, we got to keep Rodney Smith." And I was like, "They better not keep Rodney Smith for that." Uh, and they didn't, and I'm right, and that's the moral of the story. Uh, but no, I mean, people have kept, uh, have held on to, uh, held on to this idea that Adam Thielen is not athletic, even though every time it gets brought up, there's been a ton of pushback because we have objective evidence and subjective evidence that Thielen's athletic. I mean, he outruns defensive backs on the field all the time after the catch. He's a great after the catch receiver, right? And so, even in situations where where he doesn't have an advantage, right? Because when you have the ball in your hands, you're slower. Uh, They've even thrown him in the run game. Yeah, I mean, like, what he's got the, one of the longest runs of of the Vikings' abysmal running season was it 2014? He had like a 41 yarder. <laughs> like, uh, and admittedly, it was a it was a special teams fake, right? He was the punt protector then. Um, but you know, you don't get 41 yards by running something. The punter couldn't have done that. So uh, yeah, they they use him as a runner in the run game. They use him as a deep threat. It's it's weird to me. Like, it's not. He's not Eric Decker, man. Like he's not like the six five guy that uses, uh, you know, space craftiness and his size to just win in the red zone. In fact, Adam Thielen is worse in the red zone than Stephon Diggs, but he is super athletic. Uh, so uh, it's just weird. Well, I'm so glad that we have both an unathletic tight end and an unathletic <laughs> uh, number one wide receiver. So right, yeah, it's, you know, they have company. 
Like yeah, in, well, with uh, with um, an unathletic quarterback, right, Kirk Cousins. Oh, Cousins God, said yeah. after the yeah, Cousins said after the game, I can run the ball. I just uh, got to do it more often when the situation demands. And he's right. I mean, he's no Case Keenum, right? But like, he's definitely better than Bradford as an athlete. Yeah, all we need to do is just teach him to slide instead of you know instead of getting hit on his you know, eighty-four million dollar arm for no good reason. But yeah, the fumbling thing. That's. I will admit that that is a concern. Yeah, someone needs to teach <laughs> that boy to slide. Maybe hey, in the uh, maybe in the press conference next time, ask him if any of the Minnesota Twins have reached out to him to teach him how to friggin' slide. <laughs> I mean, he could learn lessons from uh, whoever taught Teddy how to slide, right? Because Teddy was just abysmal at sliding. He was. I thought was I thought it was either a, I thought it was somebody from either the Minnesota Twins or like some like some uh, there was a. There was a quarterback fairly recently that their home baseball team like went, okay, we have to teach you how to do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know, man. Life is got to <laughs> teach sliding. Uh, I think my, my favorite thing might have been Robert Griffin III's inability to slide because I think he did play baseball. So, like, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, would you want to be sliding on the turf at, uh, at FedEx? That's a good point. I realize it killed his career and likely any sort of future earning ability he had. But like, maybe that's hey, maybe that's why Kirk Cousins doesn't want to slide. He's too used to the field over at FedEx. Yeah, he's too used to FedEx. Yeah, that's that's the thing they have in common. Like, there's like bottles in there. Like I I don't want my ankle anywhere near that. I'm totally cool yeah. with you throwing my shoulder into it though. They, they must have both banded together. I mean, <laughs> and just been like, nope. Suicide pact or something. Yeah, right. We're not sliding here, buddy. Exactly. Uh, Latavius and Cook. Did fairly well. Uh, Cook obviously had the really nice run for the uh, for the touchdown, and uh, the O line seemed to be uh, blocking really well for him. Yeah, well, especially in the second half. I think in the first half we saw uh, some penetration and and some issues, but uh, yeah, in, in, in overall, I thought we saw a lot better run blocking. I thought it was a pretty remarkably good game by Pat Offline as a run blocker, especially I think to close out in the fourth quarter. I think Latavius Murray's big run uh, near the end of the game uh, was really a lot of it was a product of of really great run blocking from Pat Offline, some good stuff from Mike Remmers. Um, so yeah, no, uh, I thought that that was that was really nice to see. Zimmer, after the game, said, you know, he thought that they ran the ball well and the numbers don't necessarily back it up, but I think it looked a lot better than a lot of the games that we've seen so far. Uh, and then obviously, you know, we saw, like you mentioned, the, the Dalvin Cook catch and run, uh, which came on a screen. And there was another Dalvin Cook run that I think got marked as a run, but it was like a lateral, it was a pitch. Um, and finding ways to get him the ball in space, uh, good, more of that. Absolutely, please. Uh, for a good chunk of the season, he ranked like third in PFF's elusive rating, uh, which takes into account how many missed tackles you force and how many yards after contact you get. And it's like a multiplication of the two, which on a, from a purely mathematical perspective, I don't understand why you'd multiply them and not just normalize them and add them together. But whatever. Apparently it works. It's like predictive. I, I talked to an actual math professor, Eric Eager, about this. So I was like, this is arbitrary and weird. You just wanted to get to a number where, where 100 was a really good standard. And he's like, that may or may not be the case, but it works. So, okay. Um, so they multiply those two numbers together. And, uh, and he was third for a big portion of the season. He dropped down to like eighth among 40 running backs. Um, but the point remains the same, that he his yards per carry or whatever is not phenomenal, um, and a lot of that has to do with especially early in the season the run blocking. Um, but we saw in this game what that can translate into. It can translate, of course, into that touchdown. But he was able to really do a lot of damage once he got into space. And it's not like the Vikings need the need to run the ball to the outside a lot. Um, they just need to run to the outside more often, I think, because uh, they do have kind of some issues up the middle when they're running the ball. Uh, where, you know, either Tom Compton or Mike Remmers uh, are going to have a bad day while the other one has a really good day, right? And so that's going to mean that Kenny Clark just swallows up your running back or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would like to see more of that. I, I love I loved the, the screens, the pitches to the outside, and Cook demonstrated his phenomenal balance, his breakaway speed, his vision, uh, and so on. And so... Yeah, this was a really good game, I think, for Devin Cook. I thought Latavius Murray did a lot of what was asked of him. I really, the one thing that really, like, strikes me about Murray, um, I don't think this is a bad thing or a good thing. It's just more a stylistic thing that's kind of surprising, 
is his ability to like get narrow in really small gaps. Sometimes he'll pass up a bigger gap. Uh, and, and, and that might be the appropriate decision, right? Because there might be a linebacker lurking in the bigger gap. So it's not as if he's making the wrong decision, but it's not a decision a lot of running backs would make or have the capability of making, especially because Murray is, is such a large running back that he's ability to get skinny and just get through the tiniest of holes. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's, I think a really big part of, of why he can be a consistent runner where, um, you generally expect his, his, his low end runs to be, you know, one yard and his high end runs to be eight yards. Uh, and, and hopefully he can just kind of keep on churning out those three, four yard runs. Um, as opposed to, you know, a, a more volatile back where you get a negative seven and a positive 24 and, and you just kind of have to deal with kind of what that means. Uh, for, for Murray, it's, I think this is kind of how he generates his consistency, how he generates a lower percentage of, of tackles for loss and stuff like that, is that if the blockers are, are in the way, essentially, no matter how much room they're giving him, if they're in the way of a tackler, he'll find a way to get skinny and move up. And we saw a couple of, I think, really striking instances of that in this particular game where uh, he just found the smallest spaces to fit into and uh, and was able to generate some pretty good gains. So I guess the other thing I wanted to mention was the offensive line did really well. Um, kind of as the as the game progressed, there was the one sack that was obviously a misread when it looked like. Uh, well, I, I believe as Kirk Cousins explained it on his little podcast that uh, I say little his, his tiny pod, his yeah, little podcast yeah, his, his little thing. Aww. He, he's new to the podcast game. It's okay. There we go. We, we can say that at least. <laughs> uh, he explained on his podcast that uh, that Mike Remmers thought he heard the word for screen, so he just let that one go, and that was a uh, <laughs> that was a dangerous sack. But, yeah, uh, I'm, su- I'm surprised that he brought – I mean, he obviously has a lot of cachet to just be like, hey, right, you're coming out of the show tonight, right? But <laughs> I'm surprised he brought Mike Remmers onto the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, the offensive line did fairly well, and uh, Latavius Murray was also really active in the uh, in the blocking game. Yeah, no, I thought, I thought uh, the pass protection – I mean – there were uh, a, there was a fair amount of pressure. I wouldn't say it was like the forty percent pressure that we're kind of used to seeing, um, but it was it was slow pressure. It wasn't really quick. In under two and a half seconds, pressure would appear. Obviously, the Mike Remmers weirdness, which I don't even know like what because I mean I think aside from that, Remmers actually had a pretty good game. Um, but I mean O'Neill actually did have some trouble. I think he allowed something like five pressures or something like that. Um, so it was a uh, it was a it was a game where uh, you know Cousins wouldn't get rid of the ball super quickly, and so I don't want to blame the offensive line too much for that. And part of it's just the game plan because when you've got a secondary like that, where you've got Jair Alexander playing at just this phenomenal level, and you've got uh, you know the, this supporting cast of, of of secondary players like you know like Josh Jackson and so on that have the ability to to maintain coverage for a short period of time, that you know you can trust your receivers, Stephon Diggs, Adam Thielen, to win out in the end. But sometimes it takes a little bit longer for that play to develop, and so sometimes pressure will come. Um, but they did a really good job of preventing those pressures from turning into sacks. They did a really good job of preventing uh, quick pressure in particular. Um, so, yeah, no, I thought that the, the line did a pretty good job. Uh, at least uh, it, it's maybe uncharitable to say they were really good speed bumps. Uh, but when pressure arrived, it did arrive late, which was nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we saw some of the issues with O'Neal, uh, that, you know, we've been concerned about, uh, in this game, uh, Clay Matthews should not at this point in his career be able to generate as much pressure as he did, um, or get into the backfield as often as he did, which again, it wasn't like a ton. I mean, it's not like Matthews had a sack or anything like that. Um, but you know, you'd, you'd like to see a little bit more, um, but it's fine, right? Because if you're getting a rookie making mistakes, right? Like O'Neal, you at least want them in a situation where those mistakes aren't turning into negative plays, right? Like if he allows five pressures, that's better than allowing two sacks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good way for him to get a uh, bad film out there so that he can, uh, teach himself. Uh, you know, hopefully he's not ingraining any bad habits or anything like that, but, um, that's kind of like the best case scenario of a worst case scenario that you can ask for. So, uh, yeah, I thought I thought it was a pretty good game uh, from the offensive line, all things considered, especially because, you know, you've got Kenny Clark, who uh, is maybe the most underrated defensive lineman in the NFL, 
right now. It's really easy to use that word because you could say that about like Chris Jones. You could say that about Linval Joseph, like on the Vikings, right? Um, but, I mean, Kenny Clark is just dominant this year. And so for for them to be able to produce, especially up the middle, the way that they did, prevent pressure the way that they did, um, really good to see. And it's going to be important, right, because, you know, kind of coming up, um, you've got some pressure producers down on the schedule, including the Bears in Week 17. Before we go to the Vikings defense, I do want to take just a bit of a moment to uh, say farewell to uh, to the comments of uh, Jair Alexander, who said that the Vikings weren't good and they don't do anything like of any like note, and how often Thielen just burned him this game. It was roasted him, roasted, roasted, <laughs> toasted to a crisp, man. It was. Uh, it wasn't even close. Yeah, it, I mean. It felt good, right? Like, uh, I'm I'm a big J journalist right now, right? So I'm supposed to be objective. Uh, <laughs> but so I didn't retweet the the Nick Olson uh, montage of. MG I, however, just, did. North yeah. Code DN is where you're going to find this. Yeah, um, I did favorite it, but I'll, I'll link it in the show notes because it's great. Um, but yeah. Uh, I mean, Jair Alexander is the best performing cornerback in the NFC North right now. It sucks to say. Uh, it's weird because you've got Darius Slay, you've got Xavier Rhodes, you've got Trey Waynes, who's been playing at a reasonable level. Uh, you've got Kyle Fuller, who's playing at a really high level for the Bears. Uh, and Alexander might be the best performing cornerback right now. Um, I think when I said that, uh, Skull Troll, who's hilarious, uh, was like, ah, Reeves stunting over PFF again. And I don't, I don't even remember... I think like four weeks ago, Alexander had like the highest PFF grade in the NFC North. But that, I mean, whatever, right? Like, because because Fuller had like kind of dipped a little bit since then anyway, and so it was kind of easy to just kind of watch Alexander. I mean, his game against the Rams was just this masterclass in 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 defensive back play. Um, he was my favorite cornerback in the draft, so I'm not that surprised to see him do all that well because you know first round pick, right? He's pick whatever he was. Um, he's supposed to go in, like the top ten, maybe. Um, so it was awesome to see Adam Thielen roast him, um, especially when he says Vikings are not that tough. Uh, I mean, dude, you're oh one and one against them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. The, my favorite, I think, was the uh, was was the touchdown, like where he just shook him off, like just completely shook him off. Yeah, he, he, he couldn't uh, have he he couldn't have caught a cold at that point. He was so far away from the play. Yeah, well, and there's also the, um, I mean, the corner route over him was fantastic. That was uh, as close to, I think, mossing as, as Thielen has gotten so far, um, which is not to say he's not gotten close before, but, I mean, like, that was pretty good. Uh, he also, uh, there's an after catch. I mean, it's all in the highlight that Nicholas Olsen put together. But there's also, like, the highlight catch where um, where it was mostly yards after the catch and he just kind of pushes him just off to the side, like, you don't matter to me. <laughs> sort of stuff which this is this is the thing i kind of like about thielen is that he plays with like this level of aggressiveness that i think a lot of people i think people see thielen and they see the kid wearing the mauer jersey right which by the way he does it's i think it's hilarious it's so minnesotan um but i don't think they see the guy that like gets angry and yells at refs and like throws defensive backs aside and like gets really pissed off when he hears trash talk. I like it'd be like watching Maurer argue with a argue with an ump is basically like the is basically basically like the equivalent. Like he's just this like to a lot of people, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he's just this white bread and this like whole milk, you know Minnesota State fair looking guy. Right, which I mean that does kind of describe Kirk Cousins. It doesn't really describe Adam Thielen, despite the fact that, I mean, he wears Maurer's jerseys to games. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I like seeing that in, in this game where he just, like, threw Jair Alexander aside and, uh, and uh, he's got really aggressive celebrations and stuff like that. <laughs> and apparently he's, uh, he's light on his feet, ju- judging by that jump. Uh, into the uh, the fantastic, and we haven't talked about this yet. The, uh, oh, yeah. the fantastic limbo. Yeah, the limbo celebration is is really phenomenal. It's probably in the conversation for top five celebration of the year in the NFL. Probably the top Viking celebration this year. Way in our opinion, far better than the dead arm dance. Oh yeah, it's not even 
close. I'm glad that they turned that issue around. You know, because I brought this up as a as a serious concern for them. I mean, because why would they score if they can't sell it? Like, if those are your celebrations, you have no incentive to score, and then you're going to lose games. So that, that, I'm that's really just glad bad for they, morale. I mean, the, yeah. there's there's an obvious link between a terrible touchdown, you know, celebration, organization, whatever. You can tell the team's having a hell of a lot more fun if they, you know, are having more fun. Well, I mean, that. look who won the Super Bowl last year. The team with the best celebration. I hate to say it because we all hate the Eagles, right? Um, mm-hmm. But they had the best celebrations uh, in total all year last year, right? Uh, which I mean, that worries me too. Because who who do you think has had the best celebration all year in the NFL? To me, it's the Bears Super Bowl Shuffle one, which is a defensive touchdown celebration. Holy crap! Uh, you planned that, um, but also it was like amazing. It's, it's the, uh, it has to be the best celebration. Followed by the Saints Joe Horn one, which I mean, that should have been it because he had the prop. And put but, the prop in both end zones. Yeah, right, which Horn did not do. And he kept on scoring <laughs> in the wrong end zone for a couple of weeks. Um, I mean, that's great. And if you said that was number one and the, and the Super Bowl shuffle was number two, I that's totally fair. Um, but, yeah, I think the AI crossover from Seattle, that's a really good one. Really, really good one. Um, but I, I can't – I don't think that this Limbo one hits any of those three – but those three are such high highs. I think that if we have 10 more years of NFL celebrations, which I hope to God we do, that limbo one is is probably a top three most years. Uh, this year, it's, it's just getting outclassed. And it's, it's, it's no one's fault. These things happen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's talk Vikings defense. And we'll talk about Aaron Rodgers in just a moment. But uh, a lot's been made of the uh, choice on, uh, on pressure. Uh, to uh, to Aaron Rodgers and why was the why were the Vikings just so successful just blitzing the number of times we did? Um, yeah, so uh, I think the Vikings blitzed four times or six, a very small number of times. Uh, and I even saw someone say like, "Why don't they blitz him more?" And it's like, "What well, have you seen his numbers against the blitz, man?" <laughs> like, uh, I I mean I said in my my quick blurb before the game that maybe the Vikings should be more comfortable blitzing him because he's not the same quarterback that he used to be. So I get the desire to blitz more often. I don't want to blitz Tom Brady. I would have been comfortable blitzing Aaron Rodgers. Um, but I mean, you take a look at some of these top quarterbacks: Tom Brady, Drew Brees, uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, Russell Wilson. You take a look at their numbers against the blitz versus not the blitz, right? Versus four or fewer rushers. And they tend to be better against the blitz. Like your sack rate um, almost doubles when you blitz. And some of that's because you blitz more often on a third down. And on third down, your sack rate is doubled. Um, but, um, or, yeah, yeah. I, I think that people tend to just kind of conflate blitzing with aggressiveness, which I get because it is an aggressive move, uh, but it's a high-risk move, and for good quarterbacks, it tends not to pay off. If you have the ability to generate pressure with your front four, uh, do that. Um, Again, that's what the Eagles did. They didn't blitz a ton, right? Um, Which is not to say that, like, you know, good teams don't blitz. I mean, the Baltimore Ravens are one of the top defenses in the NFL. They've got, like, the second highest blitz rate in the NFL. So I'm not saying that, like, blitzing is bad, but I am saying it's super defensible to to go into a game plan without a ton of blitzes. They did stunt a lot. They did twist their defensive linemen a lot, and so they would attack different gaps than the one that they were aligned at, which is going to be my next article at The Athletic about how three of the four sacks came on plays where the Vikings stunted or twisted their defensive linemen, which... That first sack, you could say, you know, is probably not the result of a stunt. I think it did influence Rodgers' decision to run because he couldn't read the pressure all that well. Um, but that's one where he tried to scramble, and Tom Johnson and Anthony Barr, or not Anthony Barr, Daniel Hunter ca- caught up to him. Um, but the two other sacks, I think both Sheldon Richardson sacks, uh, were ones where you had uh, a tackle end uh, stunt. Uh, and so they did a really, really good job of creating ways to generate one-on-one matchups for their pass rushers without having to send more than four. Uh, and some of those blitzes or some of those stunts happened when the Vikings threatened to blitz and then didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, they didn't need to blitz. And sometimes it's super dangerous to blitz against somebody who knows that they can throw in the hole in coverage left behind when you do blitz. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I... Personally, if I was designing a game plan against Aaron Rodgers, I generally wouldn't. In this game, I probably would have. 
Uh, and I'm glad they didn't because it turned into, you know, a pretty good defensive performance. And the corners seem to be doing their job after that, uh, after the first two drives, but we did have a injury. Uh, Xavier Rhodes did go down with a hamstring injury. It was pretty obvious from the video that it was a hamstring injury, though Mike Zimmer has seemed to indicate that it's not as bad as, uh, as it looked. Do we have any sort of update on that? Uh, other than what Mike Zimmer just said, uh, not really. Um, it, I mean, it did look really bad. Uh, what's interesting is that Rhodes was on the injury report heading into the week with a foot injury, but he's a full participant, so it kind of doesn't, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but it, it's not that big. Uh, he goes down with this hamstring injury, and uh, I mean, he's clutching it. He's just on the ground. Some people speculated that it might be both hamstrings, which would have been fairly catastrophic from the perspective of having him play for the rest of the season. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, it, I guess it's not as serious as it looked. He took a shot at like Twitter doctors, which this is like the second time I think he's taken a shot at th- this thing he thinks is happening in the media that I don't think is happening. Like I didn't see anybody uh, on Twitter saying, ah, he's done for the season or anything like that. I mean, people express concern and that's fair. Like that looked pretty bad. It's like a fair thing to say. But I don't think anyone's like, ah, Rhodes is just out for the year now, and this is the specific injury he has. Um, the first time was uh, uh, he, like, called a presser um, about Anthony Barr trade rumors that were not in the media. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I remember our episode about that and where, you know, yeah. we were accusing ourselves of leaking information. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, sure, Um the Twitter doctors in this case, or unless he means like the literal doctors on Twitter, uh, like at Pro Football Doc, um, or is it just football? I think it's Pro Football Doc. Uh, Stephen Chow, former athletic David trainer Chow. for the Chargers. David Chow. Um, whatever. I He uh, doesn't deserve respect after what he's done with the Chargers. Really great source of information, but uh, medical bra- malpractice lawsuits and so on. Um, but yeah, David Chow at Pro Football Doc. Uh, does I mean he always hedges his bets, right? So it's not like he's like, ah, well that's definitely a, the thing that I think it is. It was like, well, it looks like this based off of like the torsion of this and 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 the movement of the this joint in this way. And he's like a medical professional, so I wouldn't call him a Twitter doctor. Um, but yeah, uh, I just want to hear. Fine. I just want to hear Mike Zimmer just refer to him as a quack. Like, yeah, I, I I just want that so badly that that it hurts. Like because it's it's clear he has some sort of sort of like a burner account. Like he has something. I I feel like that implies a level of technical proficiency, uh, and 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 Twitter familiarity that he doesn't have. Like I think I think Belichick tries too hard in the opposite direction, where he's just like, ah, I don't know anything about your face snap, your Twitter like page snapbook? profile. Snapbook is that what you what people are using nowadays? Right, yeah. I I, I think win football that, games. Ronda's in Cincinnati. Right, yeah. I think that Belichick leans too hard in one direction for it to like be believable, <laughs> you know? But um His grandkids totally set him up with a Facebook account. Right, yeah. Um but I I do think that uh that Zimmer is like genuinely like just unaware of of the how social media operates and I think he thinks of Twitter the exact same way that he thinks of like forum boards, which I'm not going to say they're all that different, but like no one would confuse Twitter for like a, a BBS board or anything like that. Right. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's all one thing to him. I don't oh, know. Oh, well, um, uh, that said, I, I do want to say this. So, uh, Xavier Rhodes gets injured, uh, a couple of people. I'm not going to say a bunch. Um, but I mean, my mentions are filled with the people who want to at me. Right. And so there's like a, they self-select for being angry or whatever, um, or self-select for being loud and very often loud means angry. Uh, and so people are like, ah, Xavier Rose got injured again. Well, he always magically happens to be injured when a big play happens. It's like he has an excuse or something. And it's like, dude, it's the final two minutes of the game. He's not taking himself off the field. Like that's insane. If memory serves, <laughs> he 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 broke up the play and then got hurt. Right, like, come on, right? Um, but yeah, so like he gets uh, he gets cooked uh, early in the game, and I don't even think that's all that accurate because 
the first, so the defensive pass interference, so that's completely his fault. I'm not going to absolve him of his mistake there. That's his fault. Uh, but I do want to say it's not as if he got roasted on that play. He didn't actually get beat. He just interfered when he shouldn't have. I mean, and then they, it wasn't even catchable anyway. But like he, interf- he clearly interfered. He grabbed the wrist. Uh, and he didn't need to because he wasn't really getting beat. He was in phase. Uh, and so people saw that as every time you know they see a defensive back commit uh, defensive pass interference, especially if it's a deep shot, they think the defensive back got beat, and I don't think he got beat there. Uh, and then, of course, he gets beat on the touchdown uh, on a back shoulder throw to Devonta Adams, which, again, it's his coverage. It's his fault. Um, he had an opportunity to break up the play or stop that route from getting to the point where he was that open. Um, but that is also like an incredibly difficult route to recover, uh, to cover. It had really great ball placement. There are very few defensive backs who have the ability to make that play. That said, we've uh, at one point put Rose on this pedestal where he is one of those few defensive backs. He's made that play in the past. Um, so it is fair to say, you know, that's kind of not who we're used to seeing. But then he doesn't get targeted for like the rest of the game until that moment, essentially, uh, where he gets hurt. And so he actually had after that, after that touchdown, which it's not like, it's not like a situation where you can say, uh, well, if you take out the 70 yard run, he actually averaged 1.9 yards per carry. So he actually had a poor game. It's not like that. Like the touchdown is, is part of the resume that allows us to kind of evaluate his game and more in full. Um, but between those two moments, between that touchdown, like in the first quarter, and the end of the fourth quarter, he had a remarkably good game. Uh, and so people will remember those three moments and say he had a bad game uh, when, honestly, he had a, a pretty good game. I mean, he was targeted only four times, only allowed 24 yards, three receptions. Um, and, yeah, like, it's fine. He, it, he did well. Um, so I, I just want to say that. Uh, that a lot of people are going to be leaving with a sour taste in the mouth for for Xavier Rhodes, even though he had, I think, on balance, an all right to pretty good game. The same thing I think of Everson Griffin, actually. So I'm going to move on from this defensive back discussion. I'll I'll, I'll circle back to it and say, you know, something about Holton Hill and Mackenzie Alexander. But uh, I want to also say this: I saw um, someone tweet out. Actually, uh, sorry to call you out, Ted at Purple Buckeye. Ted Glover tweeted out, um, you know, Everson Griffin, you know, has had an awful game so far. And it was early in the game, so it's not as if Ted was saying, ah, what a terrible game from, right. from Griffin. Um, you know, he's saying, you know, the first couple of, uh, of of snaps, and, you know, one of them was like the crack toss that ended up in a touchdown that, that Griffin had a bad game. Uh, and this was shortly on the heels of, of, of Griffin committing an offsides penalty. So I'm not saying that Griffin didn't make a mistake and Ted is making things up, but I, I don't think that's accurate either. I think Griffin had uh, a pretty good game, not as good as last week for him, um, but a pretty good game. Uh, and I think people, Hey, I think they misidentified, um, the responsibility on the crack toss and Sage Rosenfels tweeted at me after I was like, I think that's actually Rose's fault. And if it's not Rose's fault, it's Mackenzie Alexander's fault. Griffin obviously doesn't take a direct line angle to the play, but he, he fills his gap, right? So he's fine. Uh, and Sage Rosenfels tweets after me, uh, at me. Yeah, that actually is Rose's fault. So chalk one down for Rose. So sorry. Um, you despite that still think he had an all right game. Um, but that's definitely not on Griffin who, where I think that he did a decent job generating pressure. Obviously he gets that sack late in the game. Unfortunately that sack didn't end up mattering because, well it mattered in terms of taking time off the clock. So it helped win. But I think, I think Rogers converted after that sack cause it was on second down. Um, but it was one of the two third down conversions in the game that they had. Uh, but it, I mean, it was a good sack. It was just a, it was, it was the one sack that didn't include a defensive line stunt. So it was just raw talent that allowed him to do that. Um, he just won against, I think it was Jason Spriggs. Uh, and, and he did a good job getting to the quarterback, but yeah, he did a decent job during pressure. I thought he did a decent job in the run game overall. The Vikings did really well in the run game. Uh, and the crack toss touchdown was not on Griffin. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, this happens, I think, kind of a lot where a, a player can have a good game with some bad moments and we remember the bad moments and say he had a bad game. Uh, I think Griffin had a, a, a good game, not like an amazing game, but a good game. Uh, Daniel Hunter had a, a really good game, really good game. And the line uh, ended up with four sacks. Yeah, well, I mean, Sheldon Richardson had a monster game. Linval Joseph had an incredible game. Um, 
I looked the stat up for Luke Inman uh, the other day. Luke was asking me, hey, so the Vikings uh, have too high safety on third and one. That's kind of weird. And he's right. That is weird. Uh, and I was thinking about this and I was like, why do they have too high safety on third and one? You usually want to walk that safety down into the box. Why, why, why? So I'm looking at the play. And, um, I think I, this is my theory is that the Vikings wa- had too high safety because they wanted to disguise whether or not they were man in zone, because if they're in cover one, uh, the Packers are unbalanced. They're in a three by one system. They've got three receivers to one side of the field, one receiver to the other side of the field. And, uh, if the Vikings are in cover one, they're going to, or not cover one, single high, they're immediately going to give away whether or not they're in cover three or in cover one, right? Because you've got essentially three defensive backs on those three receivers on one side. If you're in cover one, you've only got two defensive backs on that side if you're in cover three. Uh, but if you're in cover two, you can have Anthony Harris be on man in man coverage against that interior slot defender uh, and rotate to cover one, or you could just be in a zone coverage. And so you could be disguising that. And then you could just be trusting uh, Linval Joseph and Sheldon Richardson to stop the run if they do end up running up the gut on third and one. And I was like, that's a that's an incredible amount of trust to take a safety out of the box in a third and one situation, which, I mean, the Vikings had more defenders than I think the Packers had blockers. So it's not as if they're insane there, right? Like, it's not as if they're they're taking a huge gamble. But it is interesting against, you know, with Mike Zimmer, this guy who's preached about, you know, A, third downs, B, stopping the run. Those are like his two things. Uh, and he doesn't have a guy to stop the run on third and one. So I looked it up. I mean, uh, Matthew Collar and and Sam Ekstrom uh, have both asked questions in, in, in pressers. I think Collar's mentioned it on his podcast. Why do people run against Linval Joseph up the gut when he does such a good job stopping it, especially on third and one? And I was like, I wonder how good those numbers are. Uh, and so in response to Luke's question, you know, I was like, well, it'd actually be really good for me to find out, in, in, to answer Luke's question, for me to find out, you know, if the Vikings really are that much better than the rest of the league. So I looked it up between 2016 and today. Uh, the, uh, the Vikings have the number one defense in the NFL at stopping runs on third or fourth and one. They've only allowed 46% of these runs to convert since 2016. The, so that's 46%. The second best team, 63%. It's not even close. Like the Vikings are just insanely good at stopping the run on third and one and fourth and one. Um, since 2016, obviously, uh, Sheldon Richardson was not here in 2016. Um, so a lot of it has to do with just how astoundingly good Linval Joseph is. The NFL average on third and one, by the way, against running plays is 73%. And the Vikings are at 46%. And Linval Joseph demonstrated once more kind of why he's unique, I think, among nose tackles. Uh, I was talking to, again, Eric Eager over at Pro Football Focus. Uh, he was showing me um, kind of a lot of how the model worked in terms of how they've generated wins above replacement and assigning value to players. And, you know, how is it that Cole Beasley in 2016 or 2017 could be worth eight wins above replacement? That's insane, in my opinion, for a receiver. I still think it is. I don't think that's correct. But, uh, you know, I, I, I saw Linval Joseph has a positive wins above replacement. And I was like, well, that's uh, unusual, not because Linval isn't good. He's really good. But Eric is one of those guys that that thinks that the way that we talk about running the ball is is backwards and wrong because running the ball me- tends to result in, in negative winning situations. You tend to produce a negative win probability on runs. And in fact, most running backs, most really good running backs have uh, negative expected points added or negative win probability added. Um, because by the very fact of giving them the ball, you're decreasing your efficiency for that play. Uh, and so really good running backs will have negative wins above replacement sometimes um, because a really bad running back, you're not going to give them the ball. You're going to throw it. Um, so um, which, you know, that's like maybe a problem with the stat. But uh, Linval was had a positive wins above replacement. And I was like, that's weird, right? Like are, how many nose tackles does this happen to? And, and Eric said, Linval's unique. I was like, oh, that's great for my takes. That's fantastic. Um, but it, this is a, a situation where all those guys on Twitter that talk about how running doesn't matter or running backs at least don't matter. Uh, so you're Ben Baldwin's, you're at Frisco Josh's, you're at PFF Eric's. They all think you should run the ball in third and one. 
Because again, it converts at like 73%. That's insane. That's higher than your completion rate. Um, so uh, they all think there are situations where it's appropriate to run the ball. This is one of those situations, unless you have something unique. And that's Linval Joseph. So that's really cool. Uh, that's how good Linval Joseph is. That's how good he was in this game. He did a really phenomenal job, I think, at preventing the Packers from generating positive uh, expected points, essentially, from staying ahead of the chains, as it were, uh, in the running game, despite the fact that Aaron Jones is like way better than any running back they had available to them in week two. So the last thing I want to talk about is something that has been brought up a lot by, uh, well, Packers Twitter and Packers uh, fans have been talking about whether or not it's Aaron Rodgers as the problem or Mike McCarthy as the problem. Now, Mike McCarthy in the presser was saying that he's got to coach better. Got to coach better. Vikings fans are fine at the level of coaching happening for uh, happening for the Packers, despite the national media clamoring for McCarthy's head. Was Rodgers phoning it in here? There were a couple of McNabb worm burners that, boy, if there's nothing wrong with him, then, and this is actually the decline of Aaron Rodgers, can we pop some champagne up in here? Yeah, so this this is so fascinating to me for so many reasons. A, let's absolutely pop some champagne. Aaron Rodgers is dead, you know. Long live Aaron Rodgers. Dead, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, here's the thing that bothers me about Rodgers. If he played for any other team, I'd probably like him. But man, I hate him. Um, but you know, so I think Packers fans are so unused to not having remarkably high level play at quarterback that they're asking questions like, "Is Aaron Rodgers the problem?" And it's like. Okay, so he's not playing like he's the best quarterback in the NFL. Objectively, if you account for the broken coaching and the scheme and the play calling, if you account for the fact that his offensive line is not as good as it was, if you account for the fact that his receiving core, as 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 promising as it is, and I think it's a really promising receiving core right now, more promising than it was two years ago, um, is not as in sync and as talented as like the the peak of having Jordy Nelson and James Jones and and Greg Jennings, who I was actually good guys. Uh, um, you know, if you account for all of that, right? Uh, he's not playing as well as he did, um, and he hasn't played that well since 2015 or 2014, really, because 2015 is kind of when it started. Um, and there are those situations where he's he's dirting the ball. I think everyone remembers the primetime game from a week ago where he threw it short on third and two somehow uh, to an open receiver uh, at the end of the game on the, in, the, in the fourth quarter where, where they could have organized a winning drive. Um, he's not playing as well as, as he should uh, or as we expect him to. That's also the same game where he threw like a 50-yard dime touchdown to some dude they found in the parking lot, like Robert Tanyan or whatever. Like, I've never heard of this guy, right? And he, I, I asked Justice Mosqueda, like, who the hell is this guy? And he's like, okay, so he was, he, was, the he was bagging groceries at Kroger the week before. Right, yeah, exactly. And and he and just Justice was like, Well, if you think about the tight ends as two positions, right? You've got your receiving tight end depth chart and your blocking tight end depth chart. This guy is the fourth blocking tight end. And I was like, Wait, are you kidding me, man? So like, yeah. I mean he, and he threw another fifty yard dime touchdown in that same game, right? They're not in a position for that third and two to matter without Aaron Rodgers, right? So I don't think it's fair to say that he's the problem, but it is fair to say that he's not playing at the level that you know we expect to see from him we no one would be surprised uh if at the beginning of the season Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes had just like swapped bodies right monster style or swapped talents monster style uh because Patrick Mahomes is playing like Aaron Rodgers should be playing and Aaron Rodgers is playing like a second year quarterback should be playing which above average (laughs) um he's certainly like playing like a top 10 quarterback he's the Mitch Trubisky of quarterbacks wow man did I, 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 I did that thing where I said it aloud, didn't I? <laughs> uh, no, no, he's playing like a top 10 quarterback, not a top oh. 10 running back. Yeah. Uh, him and Josh Allen, man, generational running back talents. Um, <laughs> Carson yeah. wants too, but he doesn't get enough option. He doesn't get enough opportunity to run. They should yeah, do right. more to get him to run. I mean, on, after the way he's been playing. He's not, a, mean, he's not a quarterback. I mean, I'm just, you know, throwing yeah, him yeah. out there. I mean, just look at him. He doesn't 
He doesn't. He doesn't have the face <laughs> of a franchise, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so saying Rodgers is is the problem is dumb, but saying Rodgers is not playing to his salary is fair, right? And and his salary consumes resources that the Packers could not use. And Zach Cruz was making this argument on Twitter, uh, either late last night or two nights ago, or something like this. That like. Our discussion about Aaron Rodgers is not nuanced enough, but you can understand why Packers fans are like talking about this. I, and I still think most Packers fans are talking about this the wrong way. Like, get over yourself. Like, you have Aaron Rodgers, just be happy and shut up. But <laughs> like, he is playing worse than he has before, and Mike McCarthy is making it even worse. And they don't have the offensive line they used to, but that's not fair because they used to have one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. And so to say it's like average now, like whatever, cry me a river. Um, but yeah, it's it, he's not playing to his salary. He's not playing to his expectation. It's a thing of just, beauty. Just yeah, if you can't enjoy that, man, I have no sympathy for you. I'm I'm <laughs> happy that he's losing games. Uh, you should be mad, but not at him. Come on, guys. They're going to fire Mike McCarthy, so it doesn't matter. Well, if, if the national media has, a, has, a, has, their, uh, has their say about it, if nothing else. But it's, it's, it's worth bringing up just because of how like, popular the narrative has become as to whether or not this is Rodgers slipping or if it's McCarthy just being McCarthy and you know managing to somehow be worse over the years. Which he, it's not like McCarthy was taking genius pills and just like stopped this year. He wasn't good last year either. Their excuse last year was the fact that Aaron Rodgers went down early. Right. Yeah. And he, and he didn't have enough time to make up for his like first half of season stats. And, uh, and the year before he did do that. Like his first half of season stats were like bad for him. And they were still like top 15. Uh, and then he said, he spelled out the word relax or he said relax uh, and then they did really well. Or thought it. He might have just thought it. Yeah. Ended up on like t-shirts. Willed it into existence. That sounds like him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, okay, so the second thing I wanted to say, don't worry, it's not nearly as long as the first thing, is uh, this isn't really how football players decline. Uh, Adam Harstad, uh, I think it's just at Adam Harstad, it writes for football guys, and he's done a lot of really good uh, thinking and talking and writing about the way we talk about um players who decline because i mean he's a fantasy guy right and he's like so the way that you should think about it is that there's a probability that this player is going to fall off a cliff because historically players do not decline gradually they fall off of cliffs Aaron Rodgers has not fallen off a cliff this is this looks like a slow gradual decline that's kind of weird so i'm gonna that's the second thing so it is entirely possible that we're going to get this version of Aaron Rodgers uh, from here on out, which, darn shame, couldn't have happened to a nicer um, organization that's had been right. blessed with decades of, of good quarterback play. Stability. Actual decades. Yeah, actual. Man. Actual decades. Three de- – screw you guys. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the mailbag. Let's uh, go to the mailbag and go to Canary Yellow, who says, uh, Greetings. Is it me, or does the O-line look more comfortable run-blocking for Murray than Cook? I mean, from a scheme slash uh, from a scheme power slash zone perspective, not because Cook puts uh, icicles in their shoes or anything. Right. Um, I can see why you think that because I think Murray's been been the beneficiary of, of what looks like better run blocking, um, and has had a couple of games where he's been more efficient than Cook. Um, admittedly in like small samples but no i don't think so especially because uh the entire time the vikings were practicing run blocking in camp it was all zone blocking uh they didn't practice nearly any uh power or man gap concepts and and a lot of uh murray's runs are are off of zone uh, just inside zone instead of outside zone um so i understand but i don't think that's the case Next question is from Raul, who asks, Cousins complete uh, pass to Thielen on the corner out, double covered. Amazing play, but good decision or bad decision? How do you suspect PFF grades a play like this? I was wondering about this a lot, actually. And then I saw this question come in, and I was like, ah, I don't have an answer. Um, So the short version is I don't have an answer. The long version is... I, I mean, I like PFF's grades a lot. I think they provide a lot more context than people give them credit for. This is a situation where 
if you're a good quarterback, they'll give it to you. If you're not a good quarterback, they won't. And they're probably right uh, in doing so because a good quarterback can evaluate that situation for its context and a bad quarterback is likely to be lucky in that situation. Uh, as for what that means for Cousins, I mean, Cousins himself said he probably shouldn't have thrown it or something similar to that. Um, and that he was, he was lucky that, that Thielen um, helped him out there the way he did. I don't tend to take player statements like that too seriously most of the time. Players will often take credit for other people's mistakes to cover for them. Players will often say they made a bad play to make a teammate look better. Um, there are no ramifications for Cousins saying that a play was his fault. He blamed himself for the for the Remmers thing. He's like, I should have enunciated clearer. Um so, you know, I, I'm not going to take that, but I do think that that was probably a poor play um, that you happen to be the beneficiary of. Um, and it's difficult. I'm totally like open to this other argument that it's not because, uh, you know, hey, Jameis makes that throw to Mike Evans and everyone's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Mike Evans is going to win that one. Um, but, but Thielen, who's got a better contested catch rate. Than Evans, who's got better numbers in that situation than Evans, which I mean, Evans is like one of the more we should be talking about this guy in the top 10. And why don't we kind of receivers like him and DeAndre Hopkins? No one ever talks about um, unless DeAndre Hopkins isn't like a primetime game. Um, and Evans never will be. Sorry, Bucks. Um, but, uh, you know, people would be more understanding of Evans, even though in theory, objectively, Thielen has demonstrated that ability more. Um, and so you could say, well, maybe he should trust Thielen in the same way that James can, can trust Evans. But the thing is, you don't, I don't think you can place a ball for Thielen to generate an advantage there. I think he just has to find a way to win despite what happens. Whereas Evans, you can just put the ball out of the defensive back's reach and then Evans wins it. Uh, and so you've got a greater margin for error. Uh, whereas for Thielen, you just have no idea if, uh, if he, can come down with it. And if he does, it just happens to be because he's insanely talented, but not because you helped maximize the situation. So it's difficult, right? Because for some receivers and some quarterbacks, you can say that makes sense given the context. And you, you think based off of the numbers that this is one of those situations, but honestly, I don't know, man. What's interesting is that this reminded me of the other play against the Packers, uh, that was also a corner route that ended up being a touchdown that t that tied the game or essentially tied the game. Diggs had to get a two point conversion that essentially tied the game against the Packers in the fourth quarter to force it into overtime. Um, where uh, it reminded me that like that's probably not a great throw, uh, or actually I shouldn't say great throw. It was a remarkable throw. It was probably not a great decision. I should say it was an insanely good throw. Um, and, and great catch and everybody offensively that was involved in that play, just really phenomenal work. Uh, and then Courtney Cronin tweeted out that this was the lowest expected completion play that Cousins has had all season. Uh, and, and the other one to the Packers in week two is the second lowest. And the thing is for the first eight games of the season, that was the lowest. So this is based off of next gen stats. The that Bill Barnwell awarded that completion, that throw and that that catch uh, with the most improbable completion or best pass uh, in the NFL for the first eight weeks of the season because it had the lowest expected completion rate based off of like pressure and distance uh, and uh, distance to the sideline, distance from defenders, distance in the air uh, and so on, like how tight that window is um, awarded that play as, as having the 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 best pass whatever because it had the lowest completion rate uh expect completion rate there was another one i think by mahomes in like week 11 that outdid it finally um but i think this one outdid both of them so now cousins and thielen share number one and number three in that stat of, of having the a completion in the in the least likeliest situation um so i mean thielen's amazing uh and and cousins can can find ways to help him be amazing uh, which for Keenum, that's usually a backhanded compliment. For Cousins, I have no idea what that is. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going to err on the side of I don't think that was a good decision, uh, but I totally get why you would say it was. 
Uh, next question was from Ryan, who asks, with Sandejo going on IR, is this his last year in purple? Uh, I guess. Maybe. Um, I mean, you, you don't want to, like, Wally pip someone. Sandejo's actually played really well for the past year and a half. Um, his his contract uh, overpays him a little bit. I think it's $4 million a year. He's out of guaranteed money, so you can just cut him at no cost. The Vikings have a lot of cap problems. Anthony Harris is cheaper. They have a surprising amount of depth at safety, depending on whether or not they want to bring Georgia Loka back. Uh, and it, I guess the Vikings, I mean, they don't invest that much in safety. I mean, obviously Harrison Smith was a first-round pick, but he was picked before Zimmer arrived. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, th- I think all the signs point to it being his last year, um, but I think it'll be a tougher decision for the Vikings than it is for a lot of Vikings fans. I mean, Harris is remarkable, so. Uh, next question is from Luke Braun, who asks, are the Vikings using too many words in their play calls? It feels like they've chosen flexibility at the cost of way too much complexity, and at least to things like Mike Remmers thinking it's a screen when the play is curls. Uh, no. I I think um, he uh, he's the one that ended up sending us this video, like, ah, I feel stupid for asking this because on his podcast he said, you know, that uh, yeah, Remmers had the wrong word or whatever. Uh, but like, no, this is as long as, I mean, their play calls are as long as anyone else's. So, um, and it's not like Vikings offensive players are like uniquely dumb or something. It's just a mistake that happens. Uh, next question is from Hayden who asks, do you think that Delvin and Latavius should be getting the same number of carries or would you like to see Delvin getting the majority? I'd like to see Delvin getting the majority. Um, he is more talented uh he's healthy i don't think he's at a risk of additional re-injury as a result of an increased carry load um i think he's got uh better big play potential um yeah i'd like to see Dalvin get more carries uh next question is from don from ohio who asks dear mr hypocritical turkey atheist and father of a cannibal I don't know if he's talking about me or if he's still talking about well, you on that you, one. You're the father of the cannibal, I think. I don't know what that's a reference to, but I'm the turkey atheist. I that's have incredible. I have no idea. My son doesn't eat people as far as I know, but I mean, he's five. He, I don't know what they're teaching him at school. Uh, <laughs> while, it was, while it was a nice win versus the Packers, it wasn't a dominating win or versus uh, de- a depleted team. What do the Vikings need to do for the rest of the year to show that they can beat playoff caliber teams like New England, Seattle, and Chicago? Yeah, I mean, the Vikings' two best wins are against teams that we thought would be good and are not, right? The Eagles and the Packers. Um, I mean, I don't know, it's winning. I, sorry, Don, that's, that's not the answer. Um, they should win against good teams to prove that they can win against good teams. Uh, no, I think against uh, the Saints and the Rams, they demonstrated the kind of play that should lead to believe that they're they're a high-quality team. They outplayed the Saints for most of the game. They just had really inopportune uh, turnovers that uh, well, at least one of them was uncharacteristic, uh, if not both. Um, and those turnovers created short fields, and then the Saints converted. But I think the Vikings were the better team in that game. Um, and against the Rams, they were you know that close. So I think that they've demonstrated a quality of play. Uh, obviously, you, know, you don't get style points or anything in the NFL, right? You just win or lose. Um, but I don't think that their inability to kind of close out these games is an indication of their future inability, uh, you know, come the playoffs or whatever, or come this game against Chicago in week 17. Um, I think that, um, they'll, I think they'll demonstrate that ability and it's not like you've got Leslie Frazier at the helm where it just felt like no lead was safe. Uh, in the in circumstances that you had a lead, right? Because with the Lions, uh, it was like a 26, 24 point comeback or something like that in the second half to like tie the game. And it was just like, why would we have a 24 point lead just to give it up, man? Come on, Leslie. Uh, and there was like four weeks where the Vikings started off the f- four, first quarter with a lead and then gave it up. Uh, until like week five or something like that against the Cardinals where they scored like 28 points in the first quarter and even the Vikings couldn't screw that up. Um, it's not like that. I mean, the Vikings have had game winning drives. They've had fourth quarter comebacks, not this year. Um, they have one fourth quarter comeback against the Packers, no game winning drives. Um, but 
these are the kinds of things that unless you've got – and again, I, I do think that there is a quote-unquote clutchness problem or a situational football problem with Cousins that's going to be difficult to resolve. But generally speaking, like your close game record, like your record in close games does not repeat itself. So if you're like one in three in close games for the first half of the season, you're probably going to be two and two. If you're four and oh in close games – in the first half of the season, and you're in four close games in the second half, you're probably going to be two and two. Uh, your close game record is not a very good uh, ability of your, or a very good indication of your ability to win close games going forward. So obviously, it'd be better if they win, uh, you know, against the the Patriots and the Bears and the Seahawks. Um, but I don't think an inability to win against those teams is an indication, or I don't think that the fact of not winning those games. Should they not win them is an indication that they won't have that ability should they find a way into the playoffs despite, I guess, losing to those three teams. Yeah. Uh, Also from Don from Ohio, who is on the uh, short list or who is the favorite to replace McCarthy in Green Bay? Uh, Someone tweeted back Josh McDaniels and uh, that sounds hilarious. (laughs) Can he go in there and draft a, a Tebow like equivalent? Right, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Or if he could uh, just annoy Rogers to the point of wanting to get out of our division. Right, yeah, I would. I would also be in favor of Lane Kiffin. That would be great. That would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, Hugh Jackson. He's you know he's oh, gonna be looking for work. Fantastic. Yeah, he's a West Coast guy, right? That's yeah, what he, Rogers knows. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, just, they asked me on uh, the Acme Packing Company podcast, uh, Zach Rapport, before the game, uh, before the Packers game. Uh, you know, what what I think should happen. Or maybe they didn't ask me. I just told them what I think should happen. Uh, either way, this is what I said. I said, um, so they, they brought up the idea of promoting Mike Patton to, to head coach and uh, letting essentially a, a yes man be the offense coordinator and having Rodgers uh, essentially be the offense coordinator, which, you know, makes sense. Um, I actually think that would be a poor idea because I think Mike Patton's doing a really good job as defensive coordinator. I want to distract him from that. I think they should hire a special teams coordinator to be the head coach, John Harbaugh style. Maybe John Harbaugh gets fired from Baltimore, um, which I guess is a possibility. Uh, or hire Dave Tube, who's, I think, with the Kansas City Chiefs right now. He used to be with the Bears back when Hester terrorized the Vikings. Um, one of the best uh, special teams coaches uh, in the league, if not in the history of the league. Uh, you could also get uh, Jim Fossil uh, over with the Rams. Um, either way, special teams coordinator, I think, would actually be a pretty good head coach. Uh, and you could still have that yes man or an innovative young mind that would collaborate instead of uh, dictate uh, with Rodgers um, as your offensive coordinator, uh, and you'd keep Mike Patton on defense. Uh, and I think that they'll consider, maybe not a special teams coordinator specifically, but I think they'll consider this idea that you keep Mike Patton in some way, you've got a head coach, he's mostly going to be like, an administrative head coach, right? Not your Sean McVay is not your Mike Zimmers where they're very involved on their side of the ball. Um, and you've got an offensive coordinator, uh, that's like young and upcoming and, and has the ability to kind of work with Rogers instead of working against Rogers. Next question is going to be from, uh, Brendan who asks, did you receive a lot of backlash for saying Turkey is not an elite meat? I agree with you shared my thoughts at Thanksgiving with family and it didn't go over well. Love the hot take, though. Uh, so turkey is a trash meat is technically a family-friendly take. But contextually, it's like not. Don't, I mean, you don't got to tell your family that while they're serving turkey. I like the and, idea that they punished him by <laughs> – he didn't say this, but I like the idea that they punished him with, like, the driest of the white meat. Like, right. oh, you're going to complain <laughs> about it? Here's the worst of it. Yeah. Ah, you think turkey's bad? Let me give you the worst parts of turkey and prove my point. That would be very on brand. I just, I love this. Yeah, so I told my family at Thanksgiving. That was, when I saw that in the show notes, I just busted out laughing. That's hilarious. Like, I told my family at Thanksgiving that turkey is trash. And they got mad for some reason. Come on, Brendan. I mean, like, as somebody who has been spouting this theory, well, sorry, his version of facts for years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I imagine Arif has, has run into a similar issue, uh, yelling this from village to Dell to whoever will listen. Look, look, there's a time and a place for takes, right? I don't, 
go to Fargo and strike up a conversation. Well, actually, so that did happen. Never mind. Um, <laughs> if I if I ever somehow get tricked into marriage or something, you're going to have to come up to North Dakota, and I'm just going to stop in Fargo, and I just want to see you in like in like Wentz bars on a Sunday. Just, yeah, so a bar, yes, a bar <laughs> <laughs> in Fargo, and just. What are you doing with that jet, with that shirt on? You know he's a wide receiver. You know he's a, he's a running back. He's a running right? back. Come on, he's a, he's a he's a he's a he's a runner who can throw the ball. He's not a quarterback who can run. Come on, guys. Are you referring to him as like a glorified Joe Webb? Well, Carson Wentz. Yeah, I mean they both have the they have both very similar qualities. And they've Extremely both been athletic. very success. They've both oh, been I, successful in Philadelphia for a little bit. Yeah, both have been successful in Philadelphia. Uh, both have an extraordinary amount of faith in God, wear God on their sleeve. Uh, both come from um, non-FBS schools, right, as quarterbacks. Uh, both had to pick up new offenses. Uh, really, same guy, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's come to this. We've, we've just compared Carson Wentz to, to Joe yeah, I mean, Webb. That's, that's not fair to Joe Webb. I like him. <laughs> No, it's the worst part is I knew that was coming. <laughs> I knew that was coming and I couldn't brace myself because it was. <laughs> Joe Webb would have had a, a comeback game against Detroit if they had actually called that face mask. See, if you just transplanted that fake face mask call against Aaron Rodgers and actually had given it to Joe Webb. Whole different conversation. I I feel like we have to end the show now. So that is going to be <laughs> it for this episode of Norse Code. Uh, Arif, you had uh, mentioned an article earlier in the show. What are you uh, What are you writing? Yeah, I'm talking about uh, defensive line stunts. I talked to Brandon Thorne at Veteran Scout. Uh, writes for USA Football about uh, defensive line and offensive line play. Uh, about defensive line stunts and why the Vikings are so good at them. And uh, and it was a big part of the Vikings game plan against the Packers. So I'm going to highlight that. All right. Uh, again, if you enjoy the show and would like to donate to the show, you can do so in one or two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash norsecode, or you can go to paypal.me slash norsecode and send us a buck or two. Uh, that is going to be it. So for a reef, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember to tweet that, even if it is a work in progress. And we will see you later this week when we talk about the Patriots game. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed at Norse Code DN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out... We hit people in the mouth.